say that I am blessed Amen. spiritually and refreshed after listening to the messages through Pastor Sheen. Yes, we indeed we are really blessed. And this morning, as we will review, the topic was about, can you remember? The topic was about the Sabbath Sabbath, day. So, in this topic, we have discussed the connection of the manna in the Old Testament and how God provided how many years? It is for 40 years that God had been providing for His children and He had taught through this Sabbath keeping in the Israelites and in the same way in our days as modern Israelites. Yes, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we are very fortunate to know and experience the Sabbath, a day of rest and gladness. Amen. And tonight, Pastor Shin, our speaker, will be delivering the message entitled, take note of this, the message will be entitled, Be the Living Sanctuary. Basically, this is a continuation of the story of David in the Bible and how it is connected in our personal spiritual lives as God's living sanctuary. Without further ado, let us tune our hearts and minds and focus on the message about the living sanctuary. So for announcement, after the first part of our worship tonight, we will be having a communion service. And tomorrow, after the divine service, there will be a mass baptism at the swimming pool. Yes, and once again, happy Sabbath, and may we really focus on the worship that we'll be having tonight. We encourage you, once again, if you can turn off your phone, if you can uh, focus your mind aside from your seatmates, focus our mind to the message that Pastor Shin, the servant of God, will be delivering tonight. And I know you will be blessed. Again. Happy Happy Sabbath. Sabbath, everyone. God bless everyone.
For our opening song, shall we all rise and sing our theme song, That Glorious Day is Coming. Requesting everyone to please bow. Let's kneel as we pray. Our mighty yet faithful, loving Heavenly Father, we come to you, dear Lord, just as we are. Truly, dear Father, no one is worthy to come before you because our sins have separated us from you. Father, we just want to come to you pleading for your mercy and for your grace tonight. Father in heaven, we have followed the world. We have lived in and for the world. But right now, we have this desire, Father, to come back to you because we are hopeless and you are the only one we need. Father, please accept us just as we are. We appear religious, Father, if there is week of prayer, but after religious programs and week of prayer, we go back to the same person as we are. But right now, dear Father, we ask that may you cleanse us, may you wash us with the blood of Jesus Christ, and may you take away any sin in us, any self in us. Empty us, dear Father, of self, so that your Holy Spirit can fill us and can come into our hearts. Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day that you have called us to rest and to commune with you. Father, teach us how to worship you. And we ask for Holy Spirit to convict us to knock unto the doors of each of our hearts tonight that no one will leave your church 
your sanctuary unchanged. Dear Heavenly Father, I would like to uplift the worship leaders for tonight, most especially our speaker, Father in heaven. May you embrace him. And may Jesus Christ stand beside him so that only your words will be spoken and will be heard and only your name tonight will be magnified. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for we know that if we will believe in you, you'll accept us because you have desired for us to come back to you, to commune with you. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for we know and we believe that this prayer has been answered already because Jesus Christ is the one interceding on our behalf. We thank you and we give you glory for what you have done, what you are doing right now, and what you are, uh, what you are about to do in us and through us. For all these things we ask and plead in Jesus' name. Amen. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus tells us that before he comes, there will be wars and rumors of wars, pestilence, famine, earthquake, and destruction. And all these things must come to pass before we reach the edge. But brothers and sisters, let us not lose hope despite the many trials that we have to face, despite the persecution that will surely come because Jesus promised that in his name, we have already won.
We invite you to pray with us as you sit. Our Heavenly Father, so nice to be here with your presence on the Holy Sabbath day. Amen. Father, we praise you and thank you that in the name of Jesus we can come. Yes. And so we plead on behalf of Pastor Shin that you will give him the words of comfort, the words of hope, the words of encouragement, the words of assurance, so that as he stands before your people, we will not only see him, but we will also feel and see the presence of Jesus in his life. Amen. Father God, we entrust him into your care, believing yes. that you will hold him mm -hmm. as he speaks your words tonight. Amen. Father God, thank you for hearing our prayers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I need a connection for this. Good evening, church. Happy Sabbath. By the way, thank you so much for the choir, that great song, Christian soldiers, be courageous. We have won, we have won. Yes, destined for greatness. That is our ultimate goal and assurance from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We have won because Jesus has won the game. And he is the victor and he is the king of the universe. This evening as we enter this holy Sabbath day, and I preached about the Sabbath keeping reformation in this campus. How you entered and how you sit and how you listen to the message, how you prepare your hearts to meet the Lord. This evening, once again, I want to emphasize that we are directly connected with the heavenly throne room scene tonight. Here as we celebrate, enter into the 24 hours of His holiness, the seventh day. There up in heaven, God and His angels and unseen, the universal inhabitants are celebrating this beautiful Sabbath hour. Amen? Do you truly believe so? If not, you need to understand this. This place, although it could be very far from the center of the universe, but I already told you, since there is no limitation in any space in terms of the distance, every place could be the center of the universe. And since we are gathering in his name more than two or three, but 2,000, 3,000, and 23 million Adventists all over the world, tonight we feel the presence of our holy and righteous God. And we are worshiping him with the heavenly angels and the unseen inhabitants of the universe. That's why we are not the edge or tiny particle of the heavenly worship, but we are center and we are the main people, the core group of heavenly worship. That's why I'm so glad and happy to worship with you on this blessed Sabbath evening. Have you been blessed by God? I've been so much blessed. You know, coming early in the morning, I usually left my campus 6 o'clock in the morning, usually get up 2.30 or 3 o'clock and praying for you and praying for my prayer, uh, preaching ministry and arrive here about 6.50 at 7 o'clock preparing this. And again, 
encouraged by many young people, you know, praying for my preaching ministry, I was so much overwhelmed by their ministry. I've never had this kind of, you know, encouraging prayer support by the students. So AUP, you have settled and practiced very good practice. It is a great support to the minister who is doing his preaching ministry. Praise the Lord. And the songs, and especially I'd like to acknowledge some music department directors and the students. And I also, I met a lady who composed this appealing song. Good and faithful, to the edge will be saved. Man, tremendous work you have done for this week of prayer. And all the ushering part and guiding and preparing all those, you know, the programs. I'd like to express my sincere thanks to the, all the officers and the workers who put your time and contribution for making this week of prayer really meaningful and inspiring. God bless you all. This is my uh, sermon, second to the last. But I hope the administrators will invite me again at least once or twice a year so that you will not forget my handsome face and I will not also forget your beautiful and handsome face. And many of you already became my Facebook friends and already you sent a lot of emails and text messages. Thank you so much. I will try to do my best to support you through prayers and through messages and email advices. I will try to embrace you as my own spiritual children. And I will continually give my prayer support and guidance, whatever I could do for you. Learning about the life of King David. Tonight, I prepared a quite important message to you as before we celebrate the communion service. So it, it, it could be a kind of you know, preliminary message for this a holy ordinance tonight. Finally, David became a king. Ever since he was anointed at the age of 15, the next 15 years was filled with sorrows and agony. He's been fleeing himself from the hands of his old father-in-law, King Saul, very cunning leader. And he's been in different places, hiding himself. You just imagine running out of this hand. He has a power and authority to kill this man at any time. So actually, all the people in Judah and Jerusalem, they were the enemies of David. You just imagine this young man. Ever since he was anointed, he became the national hero by killing the Goliath. But instead of being loved and respected, because of this one person's jealousy and hatred, David spent 15 years running away, trying to save his own life. One time he became what? He disguised himself as a crazy man, you know? He just, you know, putting a saliva in a, uh, like a drunken person and crazy man. And the fellow's thinking, what kind of man is you just throw him away? He had gone through all those painful experiences, but yet he trusted in the Lord. He continually hold, cling to the hands of the Lord. I know you anointed me, Lord, and I trust in you. I will continually follow your step. Father God, please bless me. Right after he became a king, he desired to move the Ark of the Covenant from the land of Kiriath Jerim to Jerusalem. Actually, the, the place here, the final destination. By the way, you, we need to study, as you know, that the uh, high priest Eli's two sons, they brought the Ark of the Covenant to the battlefield. And instead of getting winning the battle, they lost, and two sons were killed, and even Eli were killed on that same day. And this holy item, the holiest item in the people of Israel, was taken by the enemies, and it was traveled many places, from the Ashdod and the second Gath, 
and then after Akron, and then after Bessemesh, and finally it was cared by Aminadab's family for 20 years. All in all, over 40 years during the government of the King Saul, he's been neglecting to take care of this most holy item from the temple of the Lord. But now this man, loving God with a spirit-filled heart, right after become the king, David wanted to bring this holy item back to Jerusalem. So, what he did, two chapters in the Bible, the second Samuel chapter 6 and the first Chronicle chapter 13, it described the things he had done. Okay, we need to take care of this. Number one, David conferred with the officers. And... He called the Levites and the priests. And according to their uh, advice, he called all the people of Israel to celebrate this wonderful national event. You just imagine, bring this most holy item from the enemy's area to his kingdom. So he wanted to celebrate with all his people. He chose 30,000 VIPs from 12 tribes. In other words, he wanted them to, cho uh, to be chosen and being a part of this great event. And a new card was made for this special event. But this was the biggest mistake David and his people made. Because God didn't allow his item to be carried by animal on the cart. It should be carried by the hands, the shoulders of the priest, chosen priest, Levites alone. But because they heard the presence of the holy ark of the God, gave many different kinds of plagues upon those many cities in Palestine. Of course, they have heard. So they were afraid. Actually carrying those, you know, the godly items is the religious practice by the Gentiles, not by the people of God. But somehow this time David got mistaken and he just allowed to make a new cart and prepared the cows and booze, and he was ready to carry. Okay. And from the house of the Aminadab, which was about 762 altitude, and he's coming down to the ground, and it has to be going up to the Jerusalem again. Although it was only nine miles short distance, somehow they planned such a way, so they prepared the new cart, and finally, the other big mistake was coming up. That was the Uzza and Ahio, two sons of Aminadab, where the Ark of the Covenant being taken care of for last 20 years. I personally understood this, maybe David and the, all the Levites, as a courtesy to the family who's been taking care of that holy item for last 20 years, giving them kind of privilege, okay, your sons, would carry this holy item. So, according to the Bible, Ahio was in front of the Ark of the Government as a kind of guide, looking back, and he was a guiding. And the other brother, by the name of Usa, we know him well, was following the Ark of the Covenant from the back. So you just imagine, 30,000 VIPs are gathering and they're lining up from uh, Kiryat Jerim to Jerusalem. Of course, all other people were there with the curiosity. Oh, what is the image of the Ark of the Covenant? Because it must be kept in the most holy place. Only high priest could see once a year. But this item being carried out, being placed in the enemy's place, and didn't care for many, many years. So, there was a kind of great curiosity and interest to see this item. Now, 
This was the big mistake. But when they came to Nakon's dressing floor, Usa put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzza, and God smote him there for his rashness. And there he died by the ark of God. Because the oxen maybe stumbled, so the new card was a little shaken. And of course the item on the top of this is, was shaken. And lo, all of a sudden, the guy who was following this, by the, you just imagine he, he was, maybe could be boastful, because, you know, thousands of tens of thousands are looking at him because he was very close to this item. And it was shaken, and on maybe unconsciously whatsoever, he just put his hands, tried to hold this, this article. Many Christians, including our maybe pastors and some of you Adventists, we have question mark on this. Why? Because Usa was killed, immediately killed. The other versions and pan of his person said his body was burst out like a great electrical shock, boom! And his body being, you know what, broken into pieces. By the Ark of the Covenant. You just imagine. So what was the reaction? Okay, the Bible said, by the way, Uzzah's name is strength. The second Samuel and also the first Chronicle, chapter 13, describe this incident. David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day. And the same also. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. David was afraid of God that day. Many of our church members, when I was young also, I would, wow. Ananias and Sapphira and Hophni and Binuas and also, you know, Nadab and Abihu. Some cases like Uzzah very close to the sanctuary, touching the items or putting the fires or offering the donations to the early church, doing something good and meaningful things in the sanctuary of God. But somehow, God immediately judged them and those individuals were killed inside of the temple in front of disciples. We need to understand this clearly. According to the Bible, two, David became angry. Angry with whom? Just by him? <laughs> no, he must be angry with God. Angry with, without any, he doesn't understand what it happens. You just imagine national event, national celebration. They prepared away all the Levites and, you know, government officers and 30,000 VIPs and all people are waving and they're ready. What's happening? And all of a sudden, and all of them, what is the judgment of God? Especially King David, because it was his desire, his plan, his first, you know, as the king of the Judah. He's trying to glorify God by moving this item to Jerusalem. What's happening? Now, let us read this. A sudden terror fell upon the rejoicing throng. David was astonished and greatly alarmed. And in his heart, he questioned the justice of God. You see? He was not only angry, but he put a question mark. What's wrong with you, Father? I do not comprehend this. Why you killed Usa? Usa is a good man who was taking care of the ark for 20 years. This young man is a good man following and guiding the new cart and the ark of covenant. What's wrong with him? Why you killed him? He put the question mark on the justice of God. 
He had been seeking the honor, uh, to honor the ark as the symbol of the divine presence. Why then that they, uh, had that fearful judgment been sent to turn the season of gladness into an occasion of grief and mourning? Feeling that it would be unsafe to have the ark of near him, David determined to let it remain where it was. A place was found for nearby at the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. So finally David gave up. Oh, maybe, maybe you just imagine if David touched, he might be killed. So he's now, you know, enlarging the ideas. What's happening if I was the one who touched, you know, all the questions. So he was so afraid of doing this, so he stopped this. Okay, I think we have to stop. And all the people, whole assembly of the Israel, they got great alarm. They, know, they didn't know what to do. So David said, is there anybody near to this? Well, let, let them care this, and I think we, we have to go back to Jerusalem. So that great celebrating day was just stopped. And now, you and I have to think about this. Transgression of God's law had lessened Uzzah's sense of his sacredness. For the last 20 years, do you think that if your physical body is closer to the holy item, you can become automatically holy because you are closer to the holy item? No way. This guy, two sons, especially Utsa, his heart has been lessened with the sense of iniquities and transgressions toward God's law. With unconfessed sins upon him, in face of the divine prohibition, he had presumed to touch the symbol of God's presence. God can accept no partial obedience, no less way of treating his commandments. My beloved children of God in this very school and tonight in this room, you and I have to realize the holiness of God. That's why the first sermon I preached, Spirit-filled, heavenly worship, re revolutionary understanding of our worship from the earthly worship style to heavenly worship experience. You and I have to come into this sanctuary with prepared hearts, consecrating ourselves, sanctifying ourselves, purifying by confessing our sins. Because if not, like this, unconfessed sins you and I have and just touched, you know, holy these items and the uh, programs being part of the preaching ministry, praying ministry, praising ministry, whatsoever you and I are doing. If we have unconfessed sins in our hearts, we are not able to be accepted. That was the message from the Lord. The fate of Usa was divine judgment upon the violation of a most explicit command. Through Moses, the Lord had given special instruction concerning the transportation of the ark. None but the priest, the descendants of Aaron, were to touch it or even to look upon it uncovered. The divine direction was the sons of Korath shall come to bear it, but they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. The priests were to cover the ark and then the Kohathites must lift it up by steps, pores. But this regulation was not Now, you and I have to have a question. If Uzza survived after touching the ark, what is your understanding? He touched 
and you know this shaken body of the ark was saved then what will happen to Uzza do you understand 30,000 VIPs including King David and all the priests and Levites and all the people, they saw it shaken and he touched for the first time by the hands of men. And if he's still alive, what kind of person Usa would be amongst all the nation? Definitely. <laughs> he would become a hero, spiritual hero. Why? Because he was the only touch, the holy item. Even the high priest cannot, even do not look through it. He touched and he said, so maybe, <laughs> why? He was the only one touched the holy item. All the people recognized him. Then this unconfessed sin still he has, in, is it good for him? He would fear the Lord then? If he's still alive, no way. He would think, I'm a sinner, because he knew that he has many, many sins inside, but still he's okay. Then he will look at the Lord God, holy God, as well. <laughs> you cannot judge me, because I did something good for you. Do you understand my point? God could not accept any partial obedience. That's why he was judged. After placed this ark at Obed Adam's house, David came back to his own palace and he's been thinking of incidents. He could not comprehend this. Day and night, he was praying and he was agonizing. Lord, what is the message? Why you killed Usa? Why you turn our joyful celebration into mourning event? Please teach me. Then he was calling one by one, the Aaron's descendants and priests, and asked, what is the regulation for transportation of the ark? And he learned the new things. Oh, I, I see. That's why. Oh, that's the one. He learned all the regulations, how they have to deal with all those holy items according to the Moses law. And he realized that he did really big mistake. And then now, after several months, the officer said that the Obed Adam, who is taking care of this ark, has been blessed by God. So his heart now being released, and okay, if that's the case, maybe God will bless us again. Let us try again. If we did something wrong for the first time, now this time we can change and we'll follow exactly what God commanded through Moses, and we will bring this holy item back to Jerusalem. Let's do it. So number one, David prepared a place for the ark of God. He put the tent specially for this item. And then he assembled the children of Aaron and Levites. And then he gathered all the Israel together at Jerusalem. And then he called 862 Levites by each families. 120, 220, 130, 80, and 112 all in all, 862 Levites by chosen for the caring or movement of the holy items. He called all of them. Then he instructed, follow exactly what Moses commanded us to do. And then he requested the heads of the Levites families, the elders, and then he requested I want you to read this. Ready, go. You are the heads of the father's house of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of God, the God of Israel, to the place I have prepared for it. For because you did not do it the first time, 
the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. David realized that he didn't inquire about all the procedures. And now he studied and he learned and he wanted to correct what he had done wrong. So he called all the elders and he said, Please sanctify yourselves before you carry this holy item. And please do it accordingly. Then we'll be blessed. And then the seven bulls and seven rams were sacrificed. As this Ark of the Covenant come out of Ab oh, oh, Obed Adam's house, you know, they sacrificed seven bulls and seven rams. And the most of her, musicians, Aesop and Herman and Jedidus, those the descendants, they're lying up and they are playing musical instruments. And then sacrifice the bull and a fattened calf every six steps. You just imagine, before he was so happy, and you know, he, just, he was just happy because this holy item is now coming to him. And all of a sudden, touched and died. But now, as himself consecrated and sanctified, yet every six steps care and stop and kill, sacrifice a bull and a fattened calf. Again, another six steps, stop and sacrifice. Another hour of the six. You just imagine how many hours it would took. Very, very difficult, but very, very serious. And then David was so happy because finally God is accepting no more kind of dying or sorrowing in a shark, but people are happy and Levites are caring, you know. He, he could sense the spiritual atmosphere as we just had in this campus throughout the week. So David, he personally think that my plan, my affair was accepted by glorious holy God. So he was so happy now. He's leaping and dancing and he was so happy. He was a king, but out of his joy, I am accepted by God. Now my plan was accepted. So he gladly he danced. You know. Now, all the way the item is approaching to Jerusalem. On the top of the palace, there was one room and a window. Michal, the second daughter of King Saul who was the wife of David, but given to the another man, but saved back. Because you just imagine, David became a king, but his former wife is living with somebody. Do you think that is possible? That's why with his authority, he requested him to send his wife back. So Michal, she came back and became again the David's wife. But because of this incident, something happened. Michal, as he was looking through the window, he saw what her husband David is doing. So happy and dancing and leaping and celebrating. This Michal, oh, what a man. His blood is dirty. His blood is poor. Why? She was princess of the palace, king's daughter. But David was a country boy, shepherd boy. From his, her mind, she's now what? Degrading her husband. Oh, poor guy. What's happening? Okay, this side. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. This robing, that's why you see, this robing means what? Put off the robe. Became almost a kind of native, naked. This robing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any burglar fellow would. 
she spoke harsh words toward her husband. I know you may be happy, but you know, you are hopeless. You are not my style. You are not my level. Something like that. David was so much disappointed by these words and the wife's harsh and angry attitude. Then, David never, never go to her. And Michal, she was childless for whole life, and she never be able to sleep with her husband anymore. Now I want you to think about this tonight. I have a question. Now you ask to yourself, am I a David or Michal before the Lord? Wednesday afternoon, I preached about the music, music ministry in the sanctuary. And the holler, the sixth way of praise in the Bible was what? Dancing. And I showed the kind of, you know, the Israel lies. They are now dancing in the synagogue, in the church. You know, you have seen somehow their kind of little free, a quiet, you know, the controlled movement. And I showed that. Please do not misunderstand. I never, never encourage any church people, especially to the youth, using the drums or, you know, moving your dance in the church. No. I simply describe there are at least seven ways of praise in the sanctuary according to the Bible. I never used any single words of my own idea. It's all coming from the SOP and the Bible. And now I'm telling you, I'm not encouraging you to dance in the church of God. But remember this. This situation, if you look at this, David and all the officers and especially Levites, they dressed with white linen, which is only dressed for the Levites, religious leaders. David, he put his white robe of linen. And he even put the linen effort, which was only priest item. And then after, you just imagine, there were all the musicians, 4,500, all those musicians from Asaph's and Hermann's and Jedidon's family, all their descendants were lined up and bring out the instruments and they played, just like a Sabbath day. I told you, on Sabbath day at the east side of the altar, with white linen, all the musicians, they played 4,000 musical instrument players, 288 vocalists, and 120 trumpeters. They blow the sound and sang the Lord, and the presence of God come into the form of the clouds. It is exactly the same format and the image, although it's in the open space. In other words, and there are more, the most holy item of God, the Shekinah glory, was carried by the priest. So I would say, although it's not a Sabbath, but it's not, you know, in the sanctuary, but somehow the format and this what? Marching a crowd is exactly the same with a Sabbath worship experience. David, as one of the humble, spirit-filled worshipers, now out of his joy because he was accepted, his holy, the Lord's holy item, the most holy item is now carrying smoothly and carefully well to the house of the Lord. Out of his joy, the inner joy, the genuine love for the Lord and thanking to this item plan. And he's now dancing and leaping and joyfully moving his body. But let me tell you, the most holy item, and according to our own eyesight, if you are condemning or judgmental to somebody, the dancing movement is like unholy, immature, not acceptable to maybe even PIC or Adventist church. So this really distinguished two items and also movement could be misunderstood. 
But remember, God didn't judge or didn't punish, but he accepted and he blessed David. But there was one man, one woman, the closest person to the heart of David, slept together, loved, engaged, married, restored by his love. This woman, what, judged, oh, what kind of person you are. She never, never understood the true love of David toward God and God's temple. That's why she was judging. You are such you cannot come to this church. Your dress, your earring, your lipstick, your finger, your earrings, your shoes, your short mini skirt. Oh, sorry, you are not allowed. Do you know what I'm talking about now? Sometimes our own tradition, our own bias, or our own narrow-minded practice for many years because of our own understanding and our own favoritism, our own personal style and favoritism. Sometimes we are blocking. Our sinners are coming into the holy place of God, asking the forgiveness of the Lord, but we are the one who pushing them out you are not able to come in. You are judged and condemned because you are different than us. Are you David or Nicole before the Lord? Because God is looking at your inner heart. He reads your inner motivation. He sees if you have any single tiny sin still remaining in your heart. My friends, that's why I told you when I was preaching about the seven ways of do not be judgmental. Try to understand what the others are doing if that is a biblical way, if that is told in the Bible. Somehow you try to open your eyes and try to embrace them. They are different. Like I already told you, Yada, someone is praying, uh, playing, is praising Yada. Do not judge. Why you are lifting your hands? You please put down and you just humble it. No. Oh, she or he is praising God in Yada. If someone is playing the violin or saxophone or whatsoever, then oh, she's playing in Zamar, the five. If someone is singing loud, you know, then Shabak. Out of his reverence, if someone is kneeling down and praising God, you know, hitting the ground and pleading his agony to the Lord, then remember his uh, now Barak. Do not put yourself on the throne of God. You are not, you are not able to judge anybody. Because God is the only one who is able to accept or decline human worship. Please be humble. Really humble yourself. David learned this. But Miko, his closest friend, life partner, doesn't understand finally she was condemned. My friend, this is very important matter. Let us read. And I hope this must be you and my understanding about the house of the Lord. Ready, go. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. And ready, go. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. And now he is saying, for zeal for your house consumes me. In King James Version, it eaten me up. My flesh, my idea, all my soul being eaten, occupied, captured by the Holy Spirit. I truly hope tonight before we go into the next ceremony, before we touch and get this holy body of Christ 
putting into our mouth and became the living body of ourselves. Please be ready to accept His glory. Actually, I have prepared the other things, but I will just go. Oops. Jesus talked to his disciples and the people. Yes, I say to you that in this place, there is one greater than the temple. I just skipped in one area. That was a David's love for the Lord. Right after he spent his time I think I need to go. Let me spend just five minutes for this because it is so important. In his last time, he prayed to the Lord, what can I do more at the edge of my life for God? He desired something. And he said, oh, I can build the temple of the Lord. Why I just do think this? And he prayed about it, but God said, you are not able to do that because you are a soldier and you shed too much of blood. So maybe your son, Solomon, will build a house for me, not you. You know, normally the human beings, you know, he is a king. Or if he desires, he could do. No matter what your Lord said, I will do. But he was humble. If you do not allow me, Lord, then I will humble myself. Okay, I will do something else. Then what? The goal is same. Temple of the Lord. So what he did, I will prepare things for the temple of God. And he was a king. He stole a lot of possessions. You know what? The Bible said he offered personally from his own pocket, own treasure, pure gold, 3,000 talents, $5.7 billion worth, pure silver, 7,000 talents, $148 million worth, Totally from his own pocket, he put $5.8 billion worth of offering for the temple of God. As the king, he's now fading away. Solomon is a rising sun. But as he gave all his money for the temple of the Lord, now the, all the office, government officers and the leaders of the societies, now they're offering, the following the same way. 5,000 talents of gold and darics, this and you just imagine it, and 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. So ordinary, $9.5 billion worth of preparation, preparation. And now it is added, the people from the tribes, Judah and Israel, all of them, Oh, king is offering, and officers are offering. This is our time. And all the congregation, boys and girls and families, all of them, they put something to this temple of the Lord. You just imagine, 100,000 talents. I believe this, you know, 100,000 and, you know, 1 million talents. I could see it's not the exact amount, but somehow David expressed such a way. So plentiful, Offerings were dedicated to this temple of the Lord. My friends, what I'm telling you, he put his whole heart, and at the same time he realized that my God, heavenly God, he is much greater than this temple itself. Oh, the how many billions of dollars you put and make it pure gold, pure diamond whatsoever. Jesus Christ, he himself, is much greater and much worthier than the building itself. Amen? David, he realized this. And he's now telling us, you are the temple of God. 
You and I are the temple of God. Do not focus on this kind of luxurious temple. In Korea and in this America, many big churches, they are putting billions of dollars, truly billions of dollars they are spending for the church construction. Now, you and I must be his living sanctuary. Apostle Paul said, don't you know that you are the temple of God? So I am, I'm inviting, where is my pianist? All right. I can play the piano, but you please play for me. I want you to sing this song with me before we go into the next. Because if we are not yet ready as a holy sanctuary to the Lord, you and I are not able to touch this holy body of Christ and blood of Jesus. So tonight, we want to be sanctified and purified not only listening to this message, but also by singing this, consecrating ourselves before we go into this holy audience. Some of you may not know this song, so let me sing for you the first time, and then after, please repeat after me. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I be a living sanctuary for you. Congregation, sing with me. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and holy. Pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. Make us, O oh Lord, pure and holy, tried and true, the church of God. With thanksgiving, O oh God, we come to your holy presence. Please accept us as your beloved children. Please sanctify us, O oh Lord, so all of us will be your living sanctuary tonight. Let's sing one more time. Lord, prepare to be a sanctuary.
we will go for foot washing service. Then I want you to meditate these words before you go and wash your feet with your partners. Let us read it together with loud voice. Ready? Go. In my kingdom, the principle of preference and supremacy has no place. The only greatness is the greatness of humility. The only distinction is found in devotion to the service of others. Now, having washed the disciples' feet, he said, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Next one, ready, go. While pride, variance, and strife for supremacy are cherished, the heart cannot enter into fellowship with Christ. We are not prepared to receive the communion of His body and His blood. Therefore, it was that Jesus appointed the memory of his humiliation to be first observed. We are entering this holy communion service in the remembrance of Jesus' death and resurrection and the sacrificial atonement for each other. And soon you and I will take the body of Christ, this little bread unleavened bread, no sin at all, holy and righteous bread, you and I will take it. Remember, you are not taking ordinary bread, but unleavened bread, no single spot of guilt or iniquities are in this bread because it simplifies the body of Christ, holy body of Christ. And soon you and I will take this pure grape juice and we believe you and I will be living together with the Lord from now on forever. Once you and I are having this bread and living water inside of us. I truly hope tonight you remember the hands of Jesus, his humble hands washing all his disciples' feet, that dirty and ugly, smelly feet of disciples. That is you and I, and Jesus will come down together tonight as you fill with the Spirit of the Lord and as you wash somebody with tears. That's the moment Jesus will come and he will wash you and me. So my friends, as we go for this holy ordinance, I'd like you to stand with me because you already heard the message how much you and I should be ready to entering this holy ordinance. Especially I want to encourage our young people, those who already made the decision to be baptized tomorrow, I want you to come this front line at this moment. And we'd like to embrace you with this whole church congregation lifting you up to the throne of grace because you will be sanctified tomorrow, blessed by the water and the Spirit of the Lord, and you will become a children of God. We want to embrace you as a part of our great holy assembly, the PI's church. So those who already made the decision to be baptized, now I want you to come to front. And now tonight I'm again appealing you. Search your heart. Either you are David or Miko. And I want you to search yourself again. Whether you are Sabbath-keeping practice or understanding of the Bible was that much pure and holy. And I want you to think about yourself as Paul encouraged you to be the holy temple of God, living sanctuary of the Lord. My friends, tonight let us cherish the blood of Jesus Christ and his bread, his own body, broken down for you and me. And now I want you to stand with me as we come closer to embrace our brethren. You please come move to the front. 
uh, to the middle side. I want you to stand with me now and we'll consecrate ourselves. As David called all the elders of the Israel and asked his people to be sanctified first, let us be sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And tonight, as we bless these young people, before they go into the water of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, let us leave their names and their hearts to the Lord, and we will finally put ourselves to Him. So after I pray, I will give you about one minute. Please search this time. You speak out to the Lord. Pray for yourself before you go to this holy ordinance. Please check yourself. Don't be Usa. Don't be Miko. But become spirit-filled worshiper King David tonight. And I will conclude the prayer and we will proceed to the food washing service. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this purification ceremony by this wonderful hour of worship. Father, we have kept the Sabbath many, many years, week by week. We have come to this church. We have served the Lord in different capacities of the service programs. We have preached. We have sung, we have dedicated, we have offered the offerings. But Lord, tonight we want to check ourselves. We don't want to touch the holy article, which is the covenant of God, the Shekinah glory with our iniquities and transgressions, our unholiness, O oh Father. Please sanctify and purify us before we touch and eat your bread and drink your wine. Father, look at these young people who are giving their hearts to the Lord, accepting you as their personal Savior. What a blessed and wonderful children of God. Yes, tomorrow morning, as they come out of the water, we believe they will be chosen and written in the book of life as the heirs of great kingdom of God and we'll embrace them as the part of our family, this holy assembly of P.I.'s church. Father, please consecrate them, purify them. Tonight, Lord, let them give their full heart to the Lord as they will fully accept it by immersion into the water tomorrow. Now, Lord, we'll try to confess our sins to you. If we have worshipped you in wrong way, as David did for the first time, planning government to celebration, bringing holy articles to Jerusalem, but the first trial was wrong, and he checked all the regulations according to the Moses law, finally he learned and understood, and he corrected. That one we want to practice now, Lord. If we have come in wrong mind and wrong concept and wrong attitude and wrong motivation, Lord, please forgive our sins. And we want to have a little time of confession, Lord. And as we alter our sins, Father God, please forgive us. And then we purify, the sanctified, and wash the blood, and we will go into the holy ceremony of your humiliation. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your divine grace, unfailing love, and your generous forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, accepting us. We are ensured and confirmed that we are forgiven tonight, and especially as we wash one another. Father God, we truly believe this is the experience of rebaptism in Christ. Father, sanctify us and purify us. Cleanse our sins tonight so that truly for the first time we will experience the partaking of your body and your blood into our body. And it will be remaining in our hearts and from now on we'll be living together with you. God bless us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May God bless you. And I believe the left side and right side, the water basins are ready. So as you listen to the song, you quietly move to the basin and get the water and make partner two by two quietly. You please do your food washing ceremony. May God bless us. Try. 